Hi folks, and thank you so much for joining our session today about tips to help children with autism thrive. I'm Jen Kearney, and I'm a digital communications manager for McLean Hospital, joined today by Laura Mead. Both the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder and management of the condition can be frightening to parents. Despite this, you can still discover what motivates children, how to teach them behaviors that you want to see, and even more importantly, how to ensure that both you and your child are having fun. In this session, Laura Mead provides insights to support children with autism through the current pandemic and other unexpectedly difficult times. If you are unfamiliar with her, Laura Mead is a teacher and administrator with 20 years of experience in special education. She's currently the educational administrator at Pathways Academy, which is McLean Hospital's school for students on the autism spectrum, with and without co-occurring psychiatric diagnoses. Ms. Mead's background is in psychology, education, and art, and her interests lie in building students' self-esteem within the therapeutic learning environment. I really wanted to thank you and uh, McLean for this opportunity to share some tips about helping kids with autism thrive, both during the unexpected times like we're experiencing right now and during the more typical everyday times, um, which we'll find aren't really typical for people with autism. And before I get started, I would like to take a minute to acknowledge the hard work of parents during this pandemic, especially parents and caregivers of students with special needs um, like autism. On behalf of all educators, and I feel so strongly about the need to say this, I want to say thank you for everything you guys are doing to keep the educational process going during remote learning, because there's only so much educators can do um, on Zoom or Google Meets. And we all know that distance learning can be tough even for kids in college. It's, it's not easy. People often take, adults when they take courses, they think, well, I'm going to do the in-person course because even though distance learning is helpful and it fits in my schedule, I really need that in-person interaction. Um, so distance learning is tough and now we have first graders logging in to online classes every day. Uh, I have to tell you a funny story. I was on the phone with my seven-year-old nephew the other morning, and I heard my sister say to him, okay, so you have a Google Meet with your OT at nine, you have speech at 10, and he asked her, what about Mrs. Rublino? And I heard my sister say, oh, I'm not sure about that, I'll email her. All the while, I can hear clicking on the keys as my nephew's typing away at his keyboard. He then says, okay, you check on that and let me know. So this is just an audio call. I can't see them, but I'm picturing my little nephew in a business suit at a big executive desk at, with my sister holding a steno pad, reminding the boss of his you know, appointments that day, ready to take dictation if needed. So it just, it cracks me up because I was like, oh my God, kids have so much on their plates and parents have even more right now. And I know so few of you actually signed up to spend your days managing your kids' different competing Google schedules, um, Google Meet schedules or Zoom schedules. You're trying to manage childcare so you can go to work, or you're trying to work from home amidst all of this. So we really just wanna say thank you um, for what you're doing. We get it, it's not easy. And you might hear everyone saying, we're so glad summer's coming, but for a lot of students with special needs, for kids with autism, there is summer programming. So you'll still have your Zoom meetings and your Google Meets, and you'll still be working on schedules. So thank you. Um, it's important that while I go through the tips, we understand that every child with autism is different. And um, Jen, can you put up my every child is autism with autism is different slide? Thank you. It's really important to remember this because what works for one student will not work for another. And so it's a little bit difficult to put out a presentation that's going to meet everyone's needs. Um, autism is a spectrum disorder in every aspect of autism, every sensory piece, learning piece, um, every aspect of it has its own spectrum. So it's like a 4D, 5D model of spectrums. Um, autism brings with it a variety of challenges. There's challenges with attention, emotional regulation, sensory regulation, communication, learning challenges, challenges with mood, anxiety, social challenges, of course. And so just keep in mind that what works for one student might not work for another. And 
what works one day might not work on another day. What works in the morning for one kid might not work in the afternoon. So it's always a process of kind of changing and reflecting and seeing what you need to tweak to make it work. Hopefully today, though, there'll be a little something for everyone. Um, so the list of things I'm going to talk about today, if I could get the next slide, I want to talk about the importance of a consistent schedule. And you've heard all of these things before, but I'm hoping we can kind of delve a little deeper into each of them. Um, Supporting children through transitions. That's a big, everyone with someone they love who has autism knows transitions are sometimes a disaster. Um, expectational flexibility, rewarding the behavior that we want to see. Seeing behavior as communication. This is a really big one and it underpins um, all of our thinking when we work with kids on the spectrum. It's always, their behavior is always communicating to us and it's up to us to figure it out. Um, which can be exhausting for parents, we get it. So this is hopefully helpful to you in some ways, but not so much pressure on you that now you think you have even more things you have to do. Um, we're gonna talk about social learning opportunities, sensory needs, uh, what motivates your child, what kind of tone of voice you can use with your child that'll really help um, kind of communicate that unconditional love that you actually have for your child, but in the moment might not be aware that certain things are coming through your voice. This is something we work on with our staff all the time at Pathways Academy. And it's just something that I always like to remind people to keep in mind. And then the last thing, just the importance of having fun for both your child and for you. Okay, so if we can go to the next slide. I would like to, um, talk a little about what it might be like to have autism. And of course, I don't know exactly. I mean, we're all on a spectrum somewhere, but I, I don't identify as a person with autism. But I do have, through working with so many kids over the years and parents um, and uh, people in my own life, my personal life, I have a sense of what it might be like. And I'd like to try to share that with you guys. Um, so, and I'm just always interested in trying to figure out what experiences might be like for other people. With autism, the whole world can feel like it makes so little sense. And that's kind of hard to relate to because we all live in the world and we're so used to it that how, what do you mean it doesn't make sense? How could it not? But for people with autism, there are hundreds upon hundreds of seemingly needless social rules that take so much time and energy to follow and to remember and to do. Um, it feels like things are constantly changing with such little notice. Um, there's so many bright lights, loud sounds. Think of how you'd feel visiting a faraway land, a country with really different customs that you've never even heard of before, a lot of formality, foods that you don't care for. Think about how you might feel um, sensory-wise in Times Square at rush hour, or maybe on the floor of the stock market exchange before the closing bell. Um, so as we think about what it might be like to have the wiring of someone with autism, to have your brain and your nervous system work in a, in a way that's a little bit different from what's considered neurotypical, although again, that's a spectrum and you know there is no normal, but to get a sense of um, what it might be like for someone I would like to take you through a little bit of a thought experiment. Um, now, parents, you know autism. You live with it day in, day out. If you're a person with autism, you're living with it day in and day out. But let's go a little deeper and see if we can help everyone get a real feel and relate. Um, okay. So imagine, you can close your eyes if you want. Um, if you're driving, please don't. Imagine you're starting a new job in Manhattan at a new company where your bright red office phone rings extra loud several times an hour. And your assistant is constantly bothering you, asking you to write information on forms all day long and often asking you to erase and rewrite neatly. How dare he, right? You have people making demands on your time all day. Clients want meetings, supervisors want meetings, and you're desperately trying to complete an important project with a tight deadline that has a real impact on your salary, 
So you want to get it done. The worst part of this company is they don't allow pre-scheduled meetings. They don't schedule appointments. They prefer that clients show up whenever they need a meeting without notice. The same goes for internal meetings as well. Nothing is planned. Everything's on demand. It makes it almost impossible to get anything done. And plus, it's in Manhattan. There's noise everywhere outside your building. Just remember that. Everyone at your company loves to wear strong perfume and cologne. It's awful. You always have perfume headache. You also always have a headache from the constant honking of horns outside your office window. Your office is located right next to a taxi stand. There's always honking. And then there's the gum chewing. Everyone also, not only do they wear perfume, they chew gum all day and they chew with their mouths open loudly. All employees are expected to chew gum. It increases productivity, the boss says. You don't mind the gum, but the flavor everyone chews is called sour milk. It tastes as awful as it sounds. Why would anyone chew it? Why is it even a flavor? Just about everyone there loves the flavor, which makes no sense to you. All employees are expected to keep eight to 10 packs of this ridiculous gum in their pockets at all times. Whenever your boss is around, you're most definitely expected to pop a piece in your mouth. It makes you gag every time. Also, whenever your boss is around, he has a constantly changing and always complex handshake that he insists you take part in. He doesn't tell you when he changes the pattern. You do your best to complete his ridiculous handshake. It can take up to five minutes. Can you just imagine what a waste of time it feels like? You can never get it right. And the worst part is everyone around you seems disappointed that you can't do the stupid handshake. Everyone else seems to just know it. Um, they understand intuitively what moves the boss is going to make, and they're able to match those moves with their own hands. How they do this, you have no idea. It seems like magic or telepathy. And why is the boss so obsessed with complicated handshakes? What a waste of time. Every 20 to 30 minutes, your boss comes over the loudspeaker and tells everyone to stop what they're doing and start a new task immediately. Every time he comes on the loudspeaker, he also reminds everyone that while you're working, you must make sure to flick your lights on and off every 15 minutes. This is another idea to boost productivity. It's so hard to remember to do this light flicking. How are you supposed to keep this in the back of your mind all day, every 15 minutes? More importantly, it's ludicrous. This cannot possibly improve productivity for one single person. When you forget to do the light flick, your assistant reminds you. You don't appreciate his tone, by the way, and he pretty much always has a tone. Your phone is ringing. You have people wait, waiting outside your office to meet with you, and your boss just dropped off your yearly employee evaluation. You look quickly to the last page and see the words in all caps, needs improvement, must work harder, written in red pen and underlined. As you leave an email half typed and switch to your next, ta next task, because the boss is telling you over the loudspeaker and you flick your lights on and off, your collar feels tight and so does your waistband. Tight waistbands are also supposed to aid productivity, says the boss. Your boss walks by your door and you pop in the sour milk gum and of course, gag. You also have the scratchiest tag in the world irritating the back of your neck. A client knocks on your door loudly. Your head is pounding. You can't even turn your office light off because the switch is now broken from all the flicking. The digital billboard outside your office is flashing sales price for love seats this week only. Your assistant brings you a travel mug with a little steam coming out the top. A little bit of joy begins to form in your heart. Coffee. You take a sip. You start gagging. You can't help but spit it out. It's awful. It's horrible. This is not your usual smooth, moderately bold French roast with a touch of cream. This is a terrible, disgusting beverage known as bitter sour horseweed tea. You look to your assistant and say, why would you ever give me this? And your assistant replies, I thought it would be nice if you tried something new. You always have coffee. Uh, so to summarize, you work in a new job in a busy city, in a busy office. Everyone makes demands on your time, but what you really want to do is finish your project and meet your deadline so you can make your salary. You have no predetermined schedule and can never take five minutes for yourself because every knock at your door means another meeting on demand. There are endless visual, olfactory, tactile, and auditory affronts. 
you have a displeased boss who wants you to work harder and tells you so via all caps and red pen, what feels like a million times a day expects you to drop what you're doing and move to your next task, while somehow remembering to flick lights on and off four times an hour. The people you work with are annoying. They don't mind sour milk flavored gum and they chew it with their mouths open. Everyone else can do the boss's stupid evolving handshakes. And please, no more bitter sour horseweed tea. I like coffee. I just want to drink normal coffee. Is this too much to ask? Please, no more disgusting gum. No more chewing with mouths open. No more perfume. No more tight waistbands. No more scratchy tags. Please, no more ringing phones, honking taxis, flashing billboards. Please, no more helpful assistant always asking you to write neater and always with a tone. Why must I go through this every day? I'm just a normal person who wants time to complete my projects. And I don't love interruptions. It's so hard to get refocused. I'm not a fan of being told what to do, and I'm not a fan of being told to stop what I'm doing to move to the next task without being able to finish. It doesn't make sense to me. It's unreasonable. Is it unreasonable to want to finish a sentence in an email before moving on? I like my favorite beverage, and I don't want to try a new one. I like the feeling of soft cotton, not scratchy tags and tight collars. Who doesn't want to feel comfortable while they're working? Um, and then to take it into the realm of some children you might know, I might say, I like to hold uh, sparkly things in the sunlight. I like to look at things that spin. I like to watch my matchbox wheels go along the carpet. I like the feel of satin on the end of a blanket. I like to hum. It's not abnormal to want to meet our own needs and for the person with autism, the world can seem to have priorities that don't match with what feels good to you, what feels right to you, and what you're looking for. So we kind of go through that exercise to remind us that not everyone is experiencing the world as we are in the moment. And that's really hard to remember because you're sitting across from me and I think, well, we're both sitting on comfortable chairs. We're both, you know, wearing comfortable clothes. We both must be comfortable. But I don't know that you have an earache. I don't know that you have a headache. You can't always see what makes someone comfortable and uncomfortable. And when you can see it, it helps you remember. But when you can't see it, you forget how differently each of us experience the world around us. And especially kids with autism whose brain wiring and whose nervous systems are different. When they put their, their hands to their ears, it's because they are hearing things louder. And just because we're not, it can be hard for us to either really believe it or kind of get behind the belief. So it's good to remember. Okay. So next slide. Um, with that in mind, I want to talk about the importance of a consistent schedule. Speaking of itchy tags, um, you've definitely heard this before, and it really varies by age and need. Um, so you might have a, a kindergartner who needs a different schedule than a student in middle school, than someone who has um, you know, gotten halfway through high school and really needs to try to focus on some real academics and they want to get into college, but they're struggling with kind of how much work they can do in a day in comparison with what kind of downtime they need. So the schedule varies. And the only way to figure it out is to really experiment. Um, if you're not sure where to start, if you're literally starting from scratch and you uh, maybe your child's teacher has put in um, the Google Docs or his email to you, here's the assignments for the week and you have to figure this out on your own. How long do I schedule the work sessions? What do we work on? How do we prioritize? Um, I would recommend start with three 15 minute work sessions with three 15 minute breaks in between or maybe two breaks in between. Um, that's if you just don't know where to start. That should be something that is relatively doable for a large percentage of children. That doesn't mean that you won't have children where you're working on helping them do a task for a single minute or 30 seconds. Um, other kids might be able to work for 40 minutes. It's so vague. But if you're not sure where to start, try 15 minutes of, let's say that in the nine o'clock, you're gonna start with math. 
um, 15 minutes of math, 15 minute break. And then maybe at um, 9.30 you might say, okay, now we're gonna do reading, 15 minutes reading, 15 minutes break. And if you want to take that and try to move it to 20 minutes, or if that's too much, move it down to 10, you'll know as you go how to adjust. Always include scheduled breaks. These are so key. It's almost the biggest takeaway for um, kids with autism that I can tell you, always schedule breaks. Because just operating in our sensory world and sitting up straight in a chair and holding a pencil and doing all the things that we're asking them to do when we're asking them to do schoolwork at home or any kind of chore or task, that's requiring resources. And so we always want to give kids a break afterwards to rebuild those resources. And I think that goes for um, all kids. Kids are kids and they'll do what we ask them to. Not always. They won't always do what we ask. But if we're asking them to do something, we always want to provide a break after. And I know it works because I see it work for me. Whenever I have something I have to do, um, I'm always thinking, okay, I'm going to do it, and then I'm going to have a cup of coffee. I'm going to do it, and then I'm going to go for a walk. So whatever it is, if we have a break, we're really, we have something to kind of work towards for a sense of relief when we're working for stuff, uh, through stuff that we don't love. Um, and as adults, we should really take more of them ourselves. We want to allow for unscheduled breaks, too. This is really important. This is, I guess, a, a second takeaway um, that I'd really like everyone to remember. When students come to Pathways, one thing that we always try to talk about is it's always okay to take a break. And what's interesting is kids coming from public school, it takes a while for them to build the trust that we mean it when we say that because typically school isn't designed for kids to take a break whenever they want. It's designed for everyone to work for 45 minutes, then you have two minutes to get to your next class, then you work for another 45. And the idea that all kids should be able to do that is ridiculous. And some kids can take a quiet break at their desk. Some kids daydream and it gives them a little bit of a break and people don't realize, the teacher doesn't even realize. But sometimes for kids with autism, they need a, or ADHD or other um, challenges, they need a movement break. They need a break to do something they prefer to kind of get back into homeostasis. So always allow the unscheduled breaks. And I know that um, sometimes people might think, well, if I allow my child to take a break, they're never going to do any work. They want nothing but break. And we get that as educators. We really do. It's sometimes about allowing a lot of that downtime and working in smaller amounts of work and building up those work periods um, and then reducing the break time. And that is doable. It's not going to happen in a week. You know, it might take months. And I know you might not want to hear that, but Let's say you have a child who you can only get to work for about 10 minutes. Uh, maybe it's a first, a first grade little guy, and you can only get him to work for 10 minutes, and every minute of that 10 minutes is like pulling teeth. And so you then give an hour break, and then you try to do a little work after that, and it's really hard to get him back. And you're thinking, well, I, maybe I should have worked for longer than 10 minutes but I'm not sure how I would have because it was pulling teeth. Just know, work on that 10 minutes a day and then an hour break, screen time, whatever it is. And then maybe the next week, try 12 minutes or 15. Just over time, increase really slowly. Um, in my field, we really look at progress through a wide lens and see absolutely tiny baby sub-steps in the context of really winning a war on education as opposed to winning specific battles. So if you can try to keep that in mind. And of course, I'm saying that as someone who is looking at kids um, that maybe have come to our program in sixth grade and uh, really struggled with doing work for more than 15 minutes. And by the time they're in 12th grade, we will see they can work for the 45 minute period, but it literally took to mid high school to get there. But it's a process you don't stop working on. So, um, and 
then I just want to say something that it's really okay to schedule downtime. And I think right now, especially during the pandemic, I know a lot of parents are trying to work from home. You are exhausted. You are trying to balance so many things, keep everyone safe. And you feel really guilty because you see this laundry list of work that your teacher, uh, your child's teacher has emailed. You feel like you need to make sure your kid gets everything done or you'll be seen as kind of a, you know, not a productive parent or not a parent that's responsive to what the school's sending. But know that as educators, we understand that you're in a different scenario at your home and there's different things that we can expect maybe if kids at school, often they're on their um, better behavior. Again, not all kids. Uh, some are on their better behavior at home, but sometimes you can get more out of kids at school. And at home, in the kind of black and white thinking of autism, home's not for work. School's for work. And so I know that's something everyone's been dealing with. But do know that it's okay to say, um, a lot of parents will say, how long how much screen time is okay, you don't want too much. And I know um, children with um, ADHD, it's parents are often concerned that it's, you know, kind of creating too much of a precedent to allow so much screen time. But I wanna give you permission to give yourself permission to say it's okay if my child is playing some video games for a while and I can take a break, it really is okay. No one expects perfection. And it's just a work in progress. It really is. Um, keep in mind, adjusting the schedule as you go, what works one day won't work the next. And that's really okay because kids have different levels of resources. Adults have different amounts of resources to utilize patience, frustration, tolerance. So you're always adjusting that schedule. Just because your written schedule and, and putting it up visually is really important for kids. Just because you say you're gonna work from nine to 9.30 on writing, if your child at 9.22 has really kind of had it and you can't get that one more sentence out, it's okay to say, hey, it looks like you're starting to get a little tired why don't you go take a break, see if you can get some energy together, and we will um, do math after your break. Like, it's okay to end early. It really is. And it will um, save a lot of heartache. We're worried about, or not worried, we're focused on quality over quantity. So, okay, the next slide, transitions. Um, transitions also vary so much child by child. And they can vary by time of day, a type of activity, mood, what kind of um, level of frustration tolerance your child has in the moment. Are you asking them to transition from something they like, uh, like playing on a switch or watching videos, to something they don't want to do, like put sneakers on and leave the house? Um, and it's important to know that a simple transition to an adult may require actually 10 different little sub skills, mini transitions. Get your shoes on and let's go actually means put down what you're doing, save your, get to a place in your game where you can actually save. Save it, power down, put your game down. Now go get your shoes. Oh, you're not wearing socks, go get your socks. Put your socks on, put your shoes on. Let me tie your shoes for you, whatever it is. Um, now stand up. Do you see how many actual little tasks are involved in just part of a transition of getting out of the house? Um, and I know often for kids on the spectrum, getting out of the house is a huge challenge. Um, so keep in mind of all those mini tasks when you're talking with kids and saying, um, like you're trying to get them ready for a transition, instead of saying perhaps, hey, it's time, we have to go to grandma's house, go get your shoes, get your socks, don't forget your rain jacket, and if you wanna bring your game, you can, but make sure you bring your switch, not your DS. Remember, all that verbiage is going nowhere. You really wanna say, time to go to grandma's, socks, shoes, jacket. Not all students can have all three, I keep saying students, not all kids can have all three reminders in one. But if you can show a visual, and let's say we're talking about an early elementary child, time to go to grandma's and you hold up socks, shoes, and jacket. The visual is what's gonna help kids realize. It doesn't mean they won't need cues. Um, even older kids could really utilize visuals, especially if you can keep things in the same place. And if you have a student that, or a kid that tends to forget to grab their jacket, but they know socks and shoes, you could say, come on, Will, we're going to grandma's, don't forget your jacket. Anyway, 
Um, what about when kids have trouble because they don't want to end their game? They just want to keep playing video games all day long. And they say five more minutes, five more minutes. Um, we've had a lot of success with allowing kids that ability to say, can I have five more minutes? It actually helps them ease through the transition. And sometimes even allowing kids to ask for two more minutes on top of that, or you know, five more minutes. It can't go on forever, so you kind of have to decide what works for your child in terms of, is it okay to just, you just get five more minutes and when it's up, it's up, or do you start with, you can ask for five more minutes if you need it, and oddly enough, not all kids will ask every time. Um, some will ask a lot of the time, but it's, it's not a guarantee. Maybe there are some kids, it's a guarantee, but for most kids, it's not a guarantee. They really only ask for it when they need it. And chances are, if they ask for it every time, they feel they need it every time. Um, and so when they say, okay, can I have five more minutes? And you say, yes. And then they say, it, you know, the five minutes is up and they say, oh, well, can I have five more minutes? Maybe that's when you say, how about three more minutes? And then we got to go and understand maybe they'll still have have a hard time after that three minutes. But it's really about being kind of encouraging and gentle instead of impatient and frustrated. And I get it. We all get so frustrated when we have timelines to meet. We need to be places. We need the kids to hurry up. But to remember that what they're going through in their world, even if they are, you know, just kind of your average teenager who seems to be lacking a sense of urgency to get out the door, even though, um, you know, the taxi is waiting outside for them to understand their experience is different than ours. And their feeling of senses of urgency, their priorities, they don't match with ours. And so over time, we can help them see that by explaining and processing after the um, moment in time, once you're kind of calm and in the taxi and driving to say, hey, you know, the reason why we really needed you to hurry up and get in the taxi was because, you know, we're going to be late to our appointment. In the moment, though, it doesn't always help to just add more information. So um, I guess my last piece on transition is to remember the main purpose is to move to the next activity, not to do it in um, a, a strict amount of time, especially with younger kids, ex especially with more rigid kids you'll get there. They will be able to transition in a, a quicker fashion. But as you're working on it and during the pandemic, remember that even if it takes 15 minutes to get off a game or 30 minutes to get off a game, the goal is to get off it and for everyone to still be calm and um, you know, doing well. Okay, next slide. Flexibility with expectations. Um, for this slide, I used a clip art with a drawing of a rain cloud. I once had a student who we were doing an activity and the activity was to draw something and to try to use five different colors and the student would only draw in pencil and it was secretly a little frustrating as a relatively new educator because I was trying to design this activity and use, uh, this was just one little part of it and it was about following directions. So use five colors, create this drawing and the student just refused and no amount of encouragement would help get this kid to use color. And I realized that using the colors is to meet my own needs as the teacher. It has nothing to do with the child's needs. Sure, I'd like to expose him to, you know, widening his repertoire of colors he uses, but if he's happy drawing with just pencil, that's not a problem. And that was really a growing experience for me. And so I use that to illustrate flexibility in terms of us as adults, we're the ones that really need to be flexible for kids that can't be. And part of um, autism is rigid thinking. And it's interesting because um, we can all be rigid thinkers at times, especially under stress. And especially when we're really depending on something and we need something to come in the mail so that we can, we need a check to come in the mail so that we can pay a bill. We need it to happen. Um, sometimes we need that our kid to get in the car so we can get to an appointment. There's times when we're rigid thinkers too because of the environment that we're living within, the context that we're in. But with kids, we really need to be the ones that are flexible and understand that anytime we ask anyone to do change, it requires energy. 
It really does. Um, I'm currently taking a course on leading change, leadership and change, and it's amazing how much literature there is out there on how to help leaders help their employees work through change. That tells me that adults have a lot of trouble with change. And why? Because it requires energy. Often the change we're being asked to do doesn't seem to be that important to us. And we feel comfortable with what we're already doing. And that really rings true to me for kids with autism because a lot of times what we're asking them to do isn't important to them. It's not that important to them to clean up after themselves or to make sure they finish some homework assignment or to uh, look at grandma when she's talking to you. So there's just so many things to remember about what's important and kind of the child and the adults competing priorities. Over time, we will help kids see. Well, the reason why you look at people when they're talking is because it shows that you're listening. Um, kids might get there. But it's also okay if they don't, because each child really is living in their own experience, and it's really up to us to remember. Um, people will ask, well, how do I teach my child to be flexible? It just seems so black and white. I say, please do this. They say no. And I think the way um, I've seen people have the most success with teaching flexibility is by narrating my own experience as an adult with a child about you know, well, I, I was really upset when I was supposed to have a phone call with my friend, but when I called, she wasn't available. And I, that really made me kind of upset. But then I remembered, well, I can just call her later. Narrating your own experience for students and then saying something, kids, saying something like, what do you think that, how do you think that would make you feel if you called your friend and they didn't answer? And engaging in a dialogue um, of course, when calm, it doesn't work when the, when the child's already upset, but engaging in the dialogue and processing. And again, this isn't flexibility won't be built in a day or a week or a month or a year. You'll see progress. But this is a multi-year kind of as children become adults, they're able to become more and more flexible. And we really see so much progress, but it's something you're always kind of chipping away at and always using opportunities to um, challenge and adjust when it feels like you're pushing too hard, of course, and to narrate your own experience and draw kids in in that discussion. Um, so what does adult flexibility look like? Uh, again, one time I had a student who would only do math if I let him use a green marker. And that, uh, as a math teacher, you just want kids to use pencil because it'll save a lot of heartache when they crumple up their paper and throw it away because they've made a mistake. But of course, I let him use a green marker. In essence, what do I care? He's doing his math. Um, the drawing, the uh, picture in pencil, Sometimes flexibility on our part is allowing a kid to do their work on the floor or um, laying on the couch, allowing breaks as kids need them, or allowing multitasking while working. Um, some kids might want to be listening to um, a TV show or a video while they're working. And even though um, those of us that grew up in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s were always told, uh, maybe 90s, were told, no, you when you're doing homework, you need to have quiet. You can't really focus if you have the TV on. You're not giving your all to your homework. We find that a lot of students do best with some sort of noise in the background. And I think probably a lot of adults can relate to that too, because I tend to um, like to have TV on when I'm working, even though I'm not watching it. Um, so there's that. Okay, next slide, reward the behavior you wanna see. Uh, it's important to note we all like praise and that is just such a commonality among all humans. Who doesn't like praise? We don't all feel comfortable getting compliments, but we like praise. It feels good to be told you're doing a good job. And with kids, when we try to determine what should we praise, there's been a lot of research that shows that general ongoing just uh, unconditional praise isn't as helpful as specific targeted praise, and especially praise towards effort. Um, 
so we really want to, whenever we see a student trying, a kid trying to get through something that they don't like to do, we want to praise that. We want to praise the effort, um, even if it was just one minute reading, and you really feel like they could have done 10, because you've seen them do 10 before, but that one minute, you can still praise and say, look, I know you didn't feel like reading today. We read for a minute, and I'm proud of you. You stuck to it. You got through it, and now we can do something fun. Um, any behavior you want to see, the proactive praising, it might feel unnatural sometimes to say, I really like how you are sitting at the table eating dinner. It really makes me happy. And you can talk about how it makes you feel as an adult, as a parent. It really makes me happy when we can all sit together because then you're attaching a bit of an emotional piece to help your child understand why it's important rather than just saying we eat at the table. It's nice to say, uh, you know, because we eat as a family and it's in your part of this family, we like to have you with it. It doesn't mean that the child's automatically to say, oh, I get it, I'm gonna sit at the table every day. But the more you can praise what you wanna see, kids can't help but try to please. And I know you're thinking, well, my kid could care less about pleasing me. He does what he wants to. He watches YouTube all day. He's not interested in pleasing, but we do see a lot of progress with praise. I encourage you to give the proactive praise a try and see. Um, and you also want to do it often. Um, just a quick story. I used to have a student who would eat books. He'd literally take, we used to give him dictionaries. He would take a book and just gnaw on it. And um, it wasn't something we wanted him to do, but he wouldn't not do it. And so we made sure the books near him were dictionaries. We made sure that, you know, mom was dealing with it at home. She understood that it wasn't something we were going to uh, eliminate completely. But we found that every time this student didn't have a book in his mouth, we would say, hey, we're so proud of you for not chewing on a book. You might think, oh, do I want to say it and then suddenly remind him that it's an option? But it really didn't work that way. We really saw so much progress because he would stand up a, or like sit up a little taller and say, oh, yeah, I'm not chewing on a book. And it just kind of allows him or her to gain a tiny bit of self-reflection into, wow, they're not doing something that they shouldn't be doing. And you noticed it. And it will, it really will help, but it takes a while and it's not going to be quick. Um, okay, next slide. This is underpinning everything um, I do in my professional life and possibly personal life too. Once I learned this as a concept, it's really made such a difference to me. All behavior starts, um, all behavior is communication and it starts with us as early as infancy when infants only have behavior to communicate. They cry. That's their main behavior to let us know they need things. It's really um, an important part of human communication. And when we're upset, we don't always have the words to explain what's going on. So as uh, a kid you know, swipes everything off the table when it's time to do the schoolwork, they're telling you they're not ready. And so it's up to us as adults to figure out what can we do to make it so that it's doable? Was it too easy, too hard? Was there too much on the page? Should we just write down one problem for you? Should we try again in 15 minutes? What do we need to do to adapt to what that behavioral communication is telling us? It's a learning opportunity for both adult and child. Every time your child is exhibiting behavior, that's a cue for you to put on your thinking cap and figure out what can I do to figure this out? What do I need to change to make things better for both of us? And we're always looking at what's behind the behavior. Um, a lot of times people will say, well, um, this kid just wants his way. He just wants to do things his way. He's just being manipulative. And I really encourage you to look behind that behavior because even if someone is just always demanding their way, why is that? Is it because their brain is wired to think rigidly and thinking flexibly is really hard? Is it because they're trying to avoid something? And why are they avoiding it? Because it causes them so much anxiety. Why kids do behaviors they do is really important. And that's the only way you're going to get to the bottom of any kind of behavior and trying to eliminate it or reduce it or um, have the student, uh, have the child do alternatives. So.
I just want to talk about social learning opportunities. So with the next slide, the social learning opportunities are everywhere. And part of what I want to say to you as a parent is it's okay not to take advantage of every single social opportunity. Um, it's often, especially with middle school and high school age students, uh, we find at Pathways that a lot of times we're not going to call them out on every little thing because it's embarrassing as you get older um, and even for younger students. So you don't have to take advantage of every opportunity and, and um, really push it. But do know that these opportunities are presenting themselves all the time, whether it's uh, in the moment for kind of social coaching. Hey, how might you, um, what's a nice way you can ask Johnny if he wants to come play in the sandbox? Or if it's after the fact, the social coaching, which is more like processing to say, well, you know, when you wanted to Johnny to play in the sandbox with you, and so you threw a toy at him, that made him think that you didn't want him there. So next time, what's another way that we can, you know, invite Johnny over to play? Um, Processing and kind of coaching when kids are in a calm space is key. If kids aren't calm, anything you say is not going to make it in because when those emotions are activated, like anger, frustration, sadness, it's really hard to take in any kind of critical thinking information in um, the higher thinking centers of the brain. They're just shut down and that kind of... Um, primal emotional part of the brain is taking over. So it's all about talking when, when kids are calm. Um, so again, this is the social opportunity, always narrating maybe for your child. Did you see it? I waved hi to Mrs. Smith. Um, that's how I let her know, hi, how are you? Um, just kind of narrating and it's not narrating once, you do it over and over and over, but again, not too much because then your child will be really sick of it, but just any time you can think of it. And I've seen parents have the most success with this. Chances are you're already doing this, but especially for younger kids as they're learning the world around them, it's up to you as a parent to really narrate things for your child because they might not have that self narrative in their head if they have autism. They don't have that little uh, part of our thinking that's like, hey, you know, Sally did this because she wanted to express this feeling and the look on Jim's face meant he thought that she was being silly. That might not be obvious to kids on the spectrum and it often isn't, so we have to narrate it. Sensory needs and support. Um, we all have sensory needs and uh, shifting in our chair, adjusting our clothes, brushing hair out of face, these are things rolling over when we're sleeping in bed at night, we're meeting our own sensory needs. And kids on the spectrum have different types of wiring, different nervous system setups. So their sensory needs are different than ours. So they might flap, they might twirl, they might do things that look strange to us because we don't have those same needs. Um, I know I might be running out of time pretty soon, but I will give you a strange little story. For some reason, when I yawn, it really helps me to yawn if I bend my fingers back, especially my middle finger. And I don't know why. It makes no sense. But it's, it's almost like I don't have to concentrate on, yawn, uh, concentrate on yawning as much if I can bend my finger back. And so that's a little window into my world of sensory needs. You might think about your own needs. What kind of, do you always feel like you need to chew gum? Do you drink hot beverages all day? Do you drink coffee to get, or soda to get the caffeine stimulation? We're always meeting our sensory needs. So the one key takeaway here is what, if your child is, is meeting their sensory needs through flapping or spinning, and it's not necessarily appropriate in the setting that they're in, maybe they're spinning in a grocery store and it's not really safe to do that in the aisles, or they're flapping and it's, um, you know, it's just causing a lot of distraction in the car while your other kids are trying to sit quietly and you're trying to drive. We never want to just say stop. We always want to give kids a, an alternative, a fidget. There's a million fidgets on Amazon and you could buy some and experiment. You probably have a ton of them in your house. You can also find some that you just have like um, a sock can be a fidget. A rubber band can be a fidget. Lots of things can be um, kind of played with to give sensory input in order to meet the sensory needs. And it takes a lot of experimentation, but I just wanted to make sure everyone knows that you never just want to say stop. 
um, because that is meeting an actual body need. Uh, Parents will say, my child is so sensitive to noise, but he plays videos that are so loud and have terrible sounds in them. Why is that? Um, This makes me think a little bit of, uh, I once read about people with anxiety sometimes really like scary movies. And it wouldn't make sense because they're sensitive and why would they like scary things? But it has to do with, it's a controlled environment you know it's a movie. So you like to be scared. You like it in a movie sense, but that doesn't mean you want someone to jump out of the bushes and actually scare you in real life. Maybe you do, but you probably don't. And so kids on the spectrum, they are sometimes playing sounds for their own sensory needs, or sometimes they don't mind loud sounds, but only if they're in control of them. Often kids will make loud sounds And part of the importance of that is output blocks input. And so if you have uh, someone that's humming, they might just be humming because they enjoy humming, but they might also be trying to block out sensory input. Introverts and extroverts, we can really relate. Introverts withdraw from sensory input to recharge and extroverts seek it. All right, so what motivates your child? I'm going to go through this real quick. This is about utilizing preferred interests. Any subject can be taught with the interests of your child, whether they like Minecraft or Thomas the Tank Engine or um, French Bulldogs. You can do any kind of subject with that, and it's okay to use the interest in order to get the work done. So if you have a math sheet and you cannot get your child to do it, But if you do it in terms of um, train cars or how many pounds of cargo can fit on a train, if you need to adapt it to make it work for your child, that is okay. That is absolutely okay. Um, And sometimes it might help students uh, at Pathways if we allow them to earn a little bit of extra free time if they can do their work. We tend to not use a, a behavioral reward system, but we do tend to say in certain occasions, hey, if you can do this, we'll give you a little extra break, or you can get a little extra time with the iPad. Um, And that is sometimes motivating uh, for kids. It's not about necessarily taking away things, although sometimes parents do need to do that in order to make things work, and that's absolutely fine. But I would say in terms of schoolwork, if you can reward um, extra time with YouTube kids or extra time with pinwheels, whatever it is that your child loves. If they can finish that page, sometimes that can help, not always. And um, in terms of thinking flexibly around the interests of your child, how can you stretch them if you have a child who loves Macintosh OS <laughs> computers and systems? Um, you might be able to get them to create cardboard versions of it, just an idea. A child who loves pinwheels might be able to find other things that spin. So we do want to try to expand the repertoire, but um, sometimes you have to be creative. Okay, so our next slide, our tone of voice matters. This is um, kind of a life lesson for us as adults. For me as a teacher, I it took me probably about three years to learn this as a new teacher way back when. And I kind of learned the lesson that it's not as important if the kids completed the lesson I had, if um, they learned what I was trying to teach them. The actual most important thing for me as their teacher was that I am in control of my own self-regulation, my own tone of voice, my own emotions. And especially kids with special needs, they have a lot of adults um, throughout their day maybe that are frustrated with them, disappointed, frustrated that they're taking extra time to do things, that they're not able to meet expectations. In a school setting, this can sometimes really happen. And people, adults might not realize that that tone of voice even though you might have kids with social skills deficits, they always pick up on that tone of voice and they know who offers unconditional regard. When you have uh, kids that have preferred staff or favorite teachers, I guarantee you those preferred teachers are the ones, the preferred staff are the ones who communicate unconditional regard. And that's just an understanding tone of I know it's hard to pick which dessert to get at the 
uh, cafeteria. And I know you're having a bit of a meltdown right now, but I'm going to give you all the time you need. And when you're ready to choose, you let me know when we're calm and when we're able to say, okay, this kid's flipping out. I'm in a public place, but I'm in control. I'm the adult. I'm the calm person. That lets everyone else know that you're in control. And so Okay, you, I know it's hard to choose. It's hard, but you make your choice, take as much time as you need. And we see success with kids being able to make that choice. It's not every time, but a lot of times we are. And the more non judgmental we are, the more understanding our tone is, the better. The question is so you need patience. You need to be calm. You need to be self regulated in order to be able to speak calmly to kids. Where do you get this kind of patience? Parents don't have time for patience. Parents have things they need to do. You're trying to Zoom for your own meetings and you have two kids that you're trying to manage their different Zoom schedules. You need them to be at the computer and get Zooming. You don't have time. Um, I guess my best advice in terms of identifying what gives you patience, what helps you be calm, is just to focus on a couple key priorities. And if your priority in that moment is for you to be on your Zoom meeting because it's really important, it's okay to give the kids a half hour break and not worry about their Zoom in order for you to remain calm. It's almost permission for you to give permission to yourself to say, I'm gonna choose my battles. And you guys are already choosing battles day in, day out with the kids. Everything's a battle when you have a, a, a kid with autism um, or a student with autism, it might feel like everything's a battle. But when you're choosing those battles and you're letting the little things go, it's really better for everyone, it really is. So it, it's hard to remind people to try to be patient because in the moment those words don't help. But I guess if you can try to meet your own needs, whether it's taking breaks, taking time for yourself, making sure that you're wearing comfy clothes and having no scratchy tags, whatever you can do to make your own self comfortable and relaxed uh, has an exponential rollout value on your children. And it might not always be easy. It's not easy for me as it wasn't as a teacher. It's not as a principal. Um, I find that I try to have the non-judgmental tone both with kids and staff, and I don't always have it. You know, sometimes I can get snippy. Um, it's hard, but it's a work in progress, and we're all working on it. We get it. No one's perfect, and if you have a growth mindset, you really can see, okay, so I was a little hard on, you know, so-and-so. Next time, I'm going to take a deep breath before I speak to them. Um, to borrow a phrase from Dr. Blaise Aguirre, I'm going to think about just this breath, just this breath for a minute. I find that such a calming phrase. It really brings me back to um, a level of homeostasis that I would never think a phrase would. And it allows me then to realize we're actually just all humans on this world trying to make a living. And it's okay for me to be frustrated, but I, I can... I can hold it in and be okay. Um, okay, so fun is everything. This is just a, a quick nod to what it's like to be a kid. Um, a lot of us forget as adults the sensitivity of children, the importance of fun. A lot of parents with kids um, with autism or ADHD will say, hey, I... I just need my child to bring dishes to the sink after dinner, and it's almost impossible for him to focus or her to focus, them to focus on this for two minutes. It's, it's four dishes, and it's so difficult for them, but yet they can focus on video games for hours and hours. Why is that? And if we look at the brain and we look at the reward centers and what stimulates those reward centers, it's really about what is interesting to the child. And you, you can't, you can expose children to different interests, but you can't make them find something interesting. And so I could talk about turn of the century tenement living in New York City for hours. I have no idea why this is such an important interest to me. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Tenement Museum um, on Orchard Street or the Tenement Museum website. I recommend you check it out where they have recreated tenement um, apartment conditions from different eras. I literally could spend hours on this website and 
I, I could never teach, I could maybe spark interest in other people, but that's my own interest and I can't teach that interest. But if you can evolve that interest when you're trying to teach me about um, the depression, then suddenly I'm interested. So interest, fun, it's really, it's everything for kids. And when you think about what's important in life, it's love, kindness, family, being present with family. Of course, making a living and preparing meals and getting people to appointments and getting school work done, all of that is part of it. But if you try to keep your mind in the bigger picture of being able to share a fun moment with your child is really what's most important. And it's hard to remember that, especially during a pandemic when nothing seems fun. Everything probably seems like a a burden and a challenge and anxious kind of situation. Find those moments of fun because it's everything for kids. What they're interested in and what they think is fun and laughing, that means the world to them. Um, okay. So that, those are my tips. I hope they were helpful. I, I realized that there's so much more that can be said on each one of them. And one might think, well, we've heard all this before. This is nothing new. I just encourage you to try to think behind the behavior, try to think of your own regulation, do what you can to be good for yourself, to yourself. And it's okay. Give yourself permission to change things up in order to give yourself and your kids a break. So I guess the first question would be one that, you know, with all the the rise of video games and kids needing that stimulation and fun entertainment, um, do you have any recommendations for educational games for younger kids or elementary age kids? Yes, um, I have a couple that I wrote down because I didn't want to forget, just in case anyone asks. Um, because I really, really like them. I came across something called Tiny Bop. It's adorable and educational. PBS Kids is one that we all know about for younger kids. Um, some kids might sense because it's PBS that it's uh, educational and they might that might make them not interested, but uh, Dragon Box is another one. Um, there's something called Prodigy, which is really nice. I myself play something called Animal Jam with one of my nephews. It's not as educational as the others, but you can learn about different animals within it. And it's a productive, constructive time as far as computers go. ABC.com, ABCYA.com. And then one for older kids, I think that they might like Stop Motion Studio. That's one that I wrote because I didn't want to forget. Stop Motion Studio is a really neat um, website that can engage kids in making their own stop motion. So you have like a Lego guy and you make him move and you make a little film of it. So. So we did get a question about my son is 17 years old and struggles to establish routine, initiate and follow through. He's very rigid and he needs cues. Do you have tips for somebody like him who can become verbally aggressive or argumentative? Hmm. I would recommend Anytime you can take the directives off of yourself as the parent and put them in a timer or checklist form, that can be really helpful. And sometimes if you can do it in a format that doesn't seem below your child's ability, like a checklist um, that's kind of discreet perhaps, or a checklist reminders on a phone. It can be hard when kids can get verbally aggressive with reminders, with cues, Uh, It's important to not take them personally. They would be directed at anyone potentially who is giving the cues. It's often, almost always, well-directed at parents. They receive a disproportionate amount of the verbal aggression. Um, But for the most part, anytime you can kind of take it off your own needs, as opposed to when you're explaining that you want the child to sit at the table because you're a family, you eat dinner together and it makes you happy. You're putting emotion into it to try to help them learn the importance. With someone that reacts really strongly, you might want to take the emotion out of it in terms of making it matter of fact. Here's the thing, you know, here's the checklist. Here's a couple of things you need to do. And it's just a matter of fact, you just got to do it, especially with older kids who are, um, you know, able to complete such steps independently, do kind of get upset when you give them cues. 
removing yourself from the picture as much as possible can help. Awesome. Um, do you know if there are medications that have been known to help children with autism? Oh, that's a great question. Um, sometimes we get asked this uh, in our program, and for the most part, we've seen students have success with different medications. We've seen students have success without medications. It's so individual. Um, and not being a medical doctor, I don't really have any specific opinions about specific medications, but I do encourage people to work with their doctors because you will sometimes find through often trial and error uh, a medication regimen that will work. There's other times when you won't find it. So it, it's just such a individual game, but it's definitely worth exploring. That's really good to know. Um, do you have any additional suggestions for a 13 year old that despite schedules and reminders still repeatedly asks for the extra five minutes over and over again? Um, how do you successfully manage that kind of situation? Great question. Um, when we have a child who's struggling with that type of thing at school, we sometimes make um, literal actual break cards or five more minute cards type of thing that they can give us. And for this child, I would do it at home. I would um, say, okay, you get three, you know, or maybe negotiate, collaborate with the child. How many do you think you should get? You know, it can't be unless these are, you know, actual physical cards. And they might say 20 and you might say, three <laughs> and you might end at five but somehow if you can involve kids in the decision making process that really helps and if it's just a physical card that he you know then hands over to you it's not going to go perfectly the first time and so you're always just kind of reiterating well this is the plan and this is what we're doing and even if this the child doesn't buy in initially you can still say this is the plan that we're doing um and it is it's hard because it would seem like, well, if you have a plan and you have these cards and okay, first time, second time, they're still having a hard time with it. But eventually, you know, third time that day, it should work. You should see kind of a, a little more compliance, a little less resistance to transition. It might take a couple of weeks. And so it might be a hard process for the adult to have to kind of deal with, but I think you can get there. I really do. So in a situation like that, where you are trying to figure out, you know, over time, that extra five minutes working toward that compromise of time, how as a parent, can you actually figure out the amount of downtime that your child really needs? Great question. Um, I would say it's really a matter of, and I think parents do this just like teachers when you're trying to get something out of a kid that you need them to do. And you might say, okay, let's see if we can do a little more. And you're sensing, you're seeing the body language, you're, there, there's restlessness. And you're like, all right, let's just finish this row. If it's like a math worksheet or something, um, you get a sense of how long you can push kids. So it is a little bit of trial and error and that amount will change. And so when you're trying to, to figure out how much work time, how much downtime, uh, some kids are really precedent uh, holders. So if you once gave 30 minutes of downtime, they will expect it every time that they say, this is the plan. So with those kids, you almost have to say, uh, like start fresh and say, well, in the month of, of July, our break time amount is gonna be different, but you gotta prep them for that. Um, but yeah, it's so individualized. The best way is to experiment. And if you're unsure, try 15 minutes. Um, yeah, it's individual. So um, any extra tips on co-occurring ASD and ADHD? That's a great question. The challenges that kids can experience with a, a brain wiring and the autism kind of style and then the ADHD style where perhaps their reward centers are weighted differently and they might not get the same reward from everyday tasks that we do but you know it really gets hit super hard when they're playing something super fun like a video game it's a double whammy it really is um so I forgot the question. Was it about tips of? It's tips for co-occurring uh, ASD and ADHD. 
I would say that you're really trying to keep in mind the rigidity uh, and inflexibility that you might have with the ASD and the need for working in short periods with high reward afterwards for ADHD. I think it's, there's something called I believe the pre-MAC principle where you intersperse a uh, less preferred task right after with a preferred task. And if, if you can kind of utilize that principle and, and do those preferred tasks, it's not about earning. It's, it's more about, okay, you worked for, you know, five minutes on this problem. Now let's go do something fun and then come back to it. The coming back can be hard, but just kind of keeping inner, for some kids it's about talking, um, more involved with talking about their interests. That's the best way we at Pathways can get some students to complete their work is we might be scribing for them on a worksheet and interspersing their own interest talk about subway trains and then ask them another, another question. And then they talk a little about trains and then do another question. And so that's okay too. Um, so interspersing and short bursts of work, I would say are, are key for both of those uh, challenges. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that's something that's applicable for all children, regardless of the ASD or ADHD diagnosis, or even, you know, some adults, especially when we're all, we're all working from home, it can be really hard to maintain focus on one thing when there's so many other stimuli around you. Um, and I've got one last question for you, Laura. So um, someone asked, we have a nine-year-old who is extremely rigid and depends on us for everything. I feel the need to continue to push him to try doing things himself and giving him expectations to do things we constantly go over, but it's causing a separation in our relationship and I don't want to be the evil stepmom. I'm not sure if I'm being too harsh, but I don't want to contribute to his rigidness. Perhaps I need to look at this differently. Do you have any advice for this woman? What a wonderful, open and honest question. Um, my advice that came to my mind right away is choose your battles. It's absolutely key, especially when you're trying to maintain good rapport with a child that finds everything you ask of them to be really difficult. You really have to choose your battles. And if it's not... Um, especially for a nine-year-old, they do have a lot of time over their childhood and adolescent years, teen years, to learn expectations. Some of them you might want to get in right away in the beginning, like if you have um, my nephew, my younger nephew, it tends to chase cats and shoo them with his feet and um, scare them. Not a, I, I mean, it's on purpose. It's not on purpose, but he thinks it's funny. And so one thing that my sister is focusing on with him, sometimes they don't win the battle of the English worksheet, but the being kind to Jenna and Skunky, that's the battle she's picking on certain days with him because that is of key importance to you know him throughout life. So kind of looking at that bigger picture, what are the priorities? Um, is it sitting at the dinner table? Is it putting the phone away during dinner? There's time to get to those, but what are the real priorities in the moment? Yeah. Thanks so much for tuning in. This actually concludes our session. Until next time, be nice to one another, but most importantly, be nice to yourself. Thanks again and have a great day.